Dr. Adrian Delia, thank you for joining us today. And we, appreci we appreciate you giving us some time out of your day, and we appreciate your commitment to answer all our questions. This interview will be split into three sections, featuring questions we have received from our viewers and the general public. Do you have any hobbies which you like to practice during your free time? I don't have much free time, but my passion is football, and I try to follow as much as I can, uh, not only international football, but specifically and more so Maltese football. Uh, obviously, people know that I was president of Birkikara, and, and I have a total passion for, for following Birkikara. Unfortunately, during COVID, we had no football, so, so uh, that was a double whammy because people had their more time but then less entertainment or, or, or sport to follow but it's something that, that I really love. What's your favorite book? Uh, the Eyes of Darkness. It's, it's, it's a bestseller actually um, and, and it, it has a really intricate story of uh, this director that lost a child and then doesn't accept it and is in this continuous sort of um, real conflict internally whether because of certain circumstances the child is still alive or not I haven't gotten to the end yet so so the story develops so, so one of the commentaries actually of uh, the reviews was whether the author uh, was actually predicting uh, the coming of COVID in, in, in parts of what he was writing. So, so really interesting. Um, do you, during your limited free time, um, do you watch any TV series as well? Not uh, series per se, although if it's a short series. Um, uh, I do watch it, but, but not one by one because I'm too, too, too impatient and, and my time doesn't permit it. But sometimes I watch three or four in a row. Um, uh, the one that I really enjoyed last was uh, Money Heist, it was really cool. Um, but mostly, if I have some time in the evening, either read or just watch a Netflix movie, which was not recommended. In your opinion, which is better? Pastiz, Stolir Cotto, Jotal Pizelli? Both, however, uh, Pizelli really gives me acid, so I have to limit myself to the first. Though not that often, because obviously, unfortunately, I'm not too good at containing my weight. <laughs> and I said it's only for Ricotta. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have any role models? When I was younger, uh, the, the, the figure of St. Francis was, was really perplexing to me, because though he was a saint and, and associated with love and charity and animals, he also was a little bit of a rebel, uh, and I, there was this, this film at the time, 40 years or so, uh, Brothers, Brother, Son, Sister Moon, something like that, I think it was called. And it's the story of St. Francis of Assisi, and I had actually visited also uh, Assisi and the monasteries and, and what have you, and the church, um, because it's, it's the, the contrast of somebody who is very charitable, very giving, very uh, generous, but then also a rebel. Then as I grew up, uh, one film that fascinated me was the story, uh, the famous Braveheart, the story uh, of William Wallace and, and, and the struggle of the clans to, to gain independence in Scotland uh, and, and the fighting spirit and the never give up, quite a number. Um, not so much only the person, but what they stood for and what they fought for. So, so, so that mix of uh, having a fighting spirit, but then also a heart of uh, gold and, and passion. It, it's something that really strikes me. Would you consider yourself to be more liberal or conservative? Mm. First of all, I, I don't like pigeonholing at all, and so, so I wouldn't categorize uh, people insofar as certain values which we were brought up with. Uh, it, it's, it's slightly more of the conservative side. However, then, insofar as being tolerant, accepting people's rights, views, opinions, what have you, uh, that then is a question of uh, 
having more of a perspective of acceptance rather than what if it was said, because that I think is the, the, the thing which most people maybe confuse. It's not what you are, but what then you uh, accept that others are. And I think that is the uh, proper way to look at things, not generalizing, because every uh, topic, opinion, sector has to be weighed in its own perspective without actually plugging it in or putting it into pigeonholes. But uh, most importantly, being also accepting of other people's views. Which political ideology are you more in favor of? Nationalism or internationalism? I think nationalism, if, if it is equated with far right extremism, etc., is dangerous. Uh, I think the modern world is becoming uh, faster but smaller. There's this, uh, I think it's more than 50 years old now. Uh, Marshall McLuhan had this. Uh, global village sort of uh, idea that the faster and, and more modern the world becomes, uh, the smaller actually or closer we come together. Uh, so I think that we need to understand that there is regional reality, uh, global reality, but also the appreciation of what makes us who we are. So yes, we need to become more internationalized in the sense of cooperating together, working together, global warming, for example, unless all states, countries cooperate, we will never be able to face the challenges and win the challenges that global warming uh, is a reality today, climate emergency, solutions in finding, fighting poverty, unless we do that on an international cooperation basis. However, that does not mean then throwing away national identity, uh, heritage, uh, which is also important. But certainly extremes are always very dangerous and best to avoid. Has your political experience changed this view in any sort of way? I think it has reinforced it, actually, because what was my personal belief and, and creed uh, has now been fortified by experiences for example, directly at the tables of uh, European Union um, participation and understanding the way that uh, presidents, prime ministers, leaders of different countries act or interact, and there you understand the need for cooperation, the need for doing things together, the need for planning long term, the appreciation of local realities and nation um, uh, heritage in, in different parts of Europe and the world, of course. But not taking those two extremes, because when that happens, then everybody becomes uh, defined and closed in, in his own interest, which doesn't help much uh, to the future of, future of the world. What or who inspired you to move from Birkirkara Football Club into the world of politics? What, then, who? Certainly not who. I was a lawyer for more than 25 years, and, and whatever I do, I do with, 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 with passion. I immerse myself. So I did not work as a lawyer. I was a lawyer. In the same manner, I was not only president of the football club I loved, but I became that because because I do it because I believe in it. At a certain point in time, I was giving a lot of my energy there, but uh, I, I was feeling that our country was at a crossroads and I couldn't but do my bit to change things uh, to the better in my mind. I have five kids and I at that point in time was feeling massive responsibility of not wanting my children to grow up in a country which was evidently going down the road, the route of corruption at an institutionalized level. Uh, I looked around me, I saw what, what it took and, and made the decision, took the decision, uh, the plunge to get into uh, politics at this level which therefore means that you really become what you're doing uh, because there is not one minute in my life which is not what I do uh, but with, with uh, belief that I'm doing that not because it is a job or a career or an ambition but because I believe that we can change things and we need to change them for the better for ourselves, for our children, for our country it's, it's totally different when, when at this level you are dedicated totally to doing something it's one thing being in politics and 
or doing politics or participating, it's another thing that you're actually living it as the only thing you do. Uh, it, it takes a lot. You have to give up a lot. But I think the reward of knowing that you can touch people and change their lives and do good, which will then last, is, is a reward in itself. So, so it's worth um, all the hassle, they say. I think it's much more than hassle. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a mission, it's a commitment, it's, it's a way of life. But yes, it is, if you really believe that you're doing it for a cause. Uh, for me it is, and I have absolutely no regrets. Where do you see yourself in 10 years? Does that involve the PN? And if so, how do you envision the, P the PN in 10 years' time? 10 years is a long time. A lot of things can change. They say that a day is a long time in politics. I'm a person that uh, evolves, wants change, believes in change. And uh, I'm not passive to it, I'm, I'm participative to it. So I know what I'm doing now, I know what I want now, and I look also at the future. I hope that if things work out well, I would be still in a position in, in politics to uh, be of relevance and of change. Uh, but uh, obviously there are so many permutations, so many uh, possibilities in 10 years time that, that you, you cannot, uh, you can plan, you need a direction, you can do everything to get there, but things change. And what I know is I am a person that adapts a lot and, and uh, optimistic by, by nature. So, however, I'm not somebody who allows things to happen and then just adapt. I am a person who, who is a catalyst myself. So, uh, from here to 10 years, you plan, but then every day you ensure that you are living that day to do what you believe in uh, and give it your utmost. I don't see myself as a career politician, so it's either politics or nothing, uh, but certainly somebody who wants to contribute effectively to do meaningful change. What do you wish for your legacy to look like? Not only in the future, I, I, I try to um, continuously uh, show or, or highlight or remind what is true rather than what is not, but unfortunately in politics uh, there are those who persist, not because they are truly in pursuit of the truth, but because uh, spinning and untruths uh, is part of uh, the, the, the weaponry that, that they use, or the tools uh, that they use. It is not something which, which uh, I think is, is positive contribution to, to politics, but certainly it exists, and it would be naive of anyone in politics to expect that that does not happen. Uh, however, one has to persist uh, in the line of truth, in the line of uh, being honest both with himself and with the people. But I have a strong conviction that at the end, truth will always prevail. How has your campaign experience been till now? Especially since it has not been like any other campaign in the past due to the pandemic. Technically speaking, the campaign has not started because uh, we have a structure where there is a due diligence process which lasts six weeks. And before that passes, there are applicants to becoming candidates. Uh, we become candidates only after that process uh, is, is uh, finalized and we would have been approved. Uh, however, I do understand that, let me just go back three years when we had my original campaign. It was uh, feasts and people and, and gatherings and, and clubs and casini and, and you know, it, it was very uh, rich with, 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 with people and, and uh, interaction. You know, that, that can't be that now. So it's a bit surreal. Uh, so the communicative has to be a little bit more limited to, to TV, radio, interviews, social media. And I think it's a little bit of a loss because uh, I certainly believe that politics is 
all about people, about helping people, about serving people, about making their lives better, about pe pe putting people in the middle of our political uh, ideologies and, 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 and efforts. So that's missing. So I think uh, a campaign is much richer with, with, with more human interaction, but that's what it is. Nobody has control on the pandemic, uh, and we need to, again, adapt. Um, staying on this, uh, um, on the, your preparations on this campaign, do you believe to be a bit helpless regarding your influence on the coming results? Uh, uh, I'm helpless at all. Uh, it all depends on the ability of the people contesting to, to persuade, to convince, to show uh, how they can uh, lead best our party to then be able to show that we are uh, serious and, and mature political opponent worthy of the people's vote in an eventual general election. Uh, absolutely not helpless. Uh, the other way around, I think I, I, I am the uh, key figure of a whole group of people, of a team of people, and, and therefore the role that, that I play is fundamental in actually being the protagonist in the persuasion of our vote. If you were to be re-elected, how would the Nationalist Party, under your leadership, tackle the issue of debt it faces, while avoiding the possibility of corporate campaign contributions from powerful business stakeholders? Actually, by continuing with the program that we have embarked on, which has, I think for the first time ever in uh, the last years, when I say last years, not the last two, three, four years, but the last 25 or more years, uh, proven to be successful. Examples, uh, we have properties in, in, in uh, basically all major localities and, and, and towns and villages, but they weren't being monetized well. So we had a few thousands of income per annum, around around uh, 18, 19, thousand per annum by next year on a program that we have embarked on that income would have uh, gone up to nearly a quarter of a million there are initiatives and marathons initiatives in having better arrangements with our banking structures and, and that helps us then to become stronger for example our media was costing us millions and we have embarked on a program over four years to diminish that and by next year hopefully we would be breaking even. So to answer your question, by continuing on a pre-planned program which was a four and a half year program and we're three years down that program with very very encouraging results we can actually achieve even better ones according to what we had planned. Uh, widening the contribution base rather than being dependent on five, ten big contributors, you can choose, and we did, to widen our base to 50,000 contributors. So uh, help from, a little help from a lot of people, rather than a lot of help from some people. There is uh, legislation which regulates this, and we abide uh, very uh, stringently to, to this legislation, which is the financing of the parties. And I think uh, it is something which will uh, guarantee to the people, to the voters, that there is no undue influence, because the crux of the matter is that there has to be no undue influence on any party, because then that would create uh, distortions of, of, of democracy. Uh, we still have to do a lot in so far as the financing of the parties. We have put proposals forward. Hopefully, in the years to come, we would have uh, even more guarantees for our citizens in so far as how parties are financed. Assuming that this structure keeps maintaining itself as planned, um, do you have a specific target date or calculate prediction on when this issue of debt can solve itself and where you can eventually break even? It's not a question of solving itself, certainly. It doesn't. It tries its best <laughs> not to solve itself. So we need to work hard. However, uh, in the last two years, actually, the party was registering a profit, which doesn't mean that the debt is cancelled because that had been accumulating for more than two decades. So our job is to control it and to then have a program 
where it starts diminishing. There is interest on debt, so the bigger the debt, the larger the interest, and therefore the faster it grows. As soon as you start controlling expenses and increasing income and start diminishing or, or, or uh, having structures where the debt is decreasing, and therefore the interest starts decreasing, and the income continues to increase with various programs that we have embarked on, all of which have been successful. Uh, there is no date specifically, and it's okay to still have debt as long as it's controlled, the debt, it's not increasing, and it is uh, within the normal parameters of the ratios of debt to property, liabilities to assets, etc. The problem is that there is good governance. That is the issue. We have ascertained that, we continue ascertaining that, and I wish for the Nationalist Party in the years to come that there isn't an attitude uh, of any leadership uh, after mine that uh, let's pay now and then somebody else, is, let, let's uh, do the expenses now and then somebody else pays later. Because it's not mine, because it's not a company, because it's not personal. We have to take an attitude that uh, we are good administrators of the party, we are good bonus pater familias, we, we say, you know, uh, somebody who takes good care of what they are entrusted with. Uh, and I think we can do it, and, and the results have shown it. We only wish, because it's not only me, but, but the whole team, that this can continue uh, in this manner. Vaguely speaking, um, how many years do you expect to go down the line before you eventually break even, however, if you had to make a prediction? If by break even you mean that the party is not losing on an annual basis, we already have achieved that. We have actually registered the profit. Our media, by next year, we would be breaking even. So, year on year, we have already succeeded to get there by next year, which was the original planned program. Then, with that, to start attacking into decreasing the debt, for me, is nearly impossible to predict for one simple reason. Uh, I do not have an indefinite term here, <laughs> because the terms are by statute, and I cannot dictate the financial programs of those who would come after me, particularly important spends, which are elections, whether it's general elections or MEP elections. So depending on who would be leading the party in the years to come, they would need to decide how much to commit to elections. Most importantly, however, is that there is a very structured, um, sustainable ratio between what the party owns, receives as income, and not keep on increasing the debt uh, in a manner which is deteriorating the financial good status of the party. The final question on my part, um, what makes you believe that you are the best person fit for the job of leading the Nationalist Party? What I need to believe is believe in myself and believe that I'm doing the right thing and actually uh, following that conviction is what the people believe whether uh, or who is the best person to, to lead the party. One thing however is that our statute provided that it is our Tesserati who decides. And the term of election of a leader is from when he is elected democratically to the next general election. And that is important for the stability of the party. So if you have an institution, whether it's a party, whether it's a, an organization of other sorts, having continuous change does not guarantee stability, whether you are talking with banks, whether you are talking with other institutions, whether you are speaking to the people. So for a party, there needs to be stability and continuity. So it is uh, one of the thoughts that, that could uh, make people understand that this in itself would also, if not respected, weaken the leaders who will follow. Because if a new leader is elected, for how long? And if the one behind him is elected, for how long? What is the term? It, it, when, when, when we have general elections, the term is five years. There are countries who have four years, and there are countries who have limits on how many times 
somebody can contest to become the president, the prime minister, the leader of an organization, and that's fine. But to actually not have that because it is questionable, we will create uncertainties which do not benefit, not, not the leader himself, but the party as an institution. Um, so in my mind, having the ability as a party to understand that and, and uh, acknowledge that if, for example, I have a general election from three months to two years, that's, that's, that's an issue. It would be unwise to change leadership, for example, six months before an election, because it takes time to get into a leadership role, to understand the structure, the system, uh, have your own team in place, and then effect uh, and give it your uh, sort of uh, dimension. So, so, so it's not as easy as one thing, that, that you have somebody, the next day you have somebody else, and it's as if uh, things will work on their own. Uh, and I think that is maybe sometimes a little bit Sort of not, not, not given too much importance by, by people from the outside of the party. Um, to start off with, correct me if I'm wrong, of course. As of late, you always seem to give the impression that one of your top priorities is gaining and maintaining the support of the card carrying members of the party known as, known as the Tesserati. Um, apart from the Tesserati, how do you plan on? engaging with a much wider electorate of voters and how do you intend to um, engage specifically with um, labor voters specifically labor youths so in the last years the national party took a very courageous decision to elect its leader not by having only its councillors vote but its full membership the Tessera. basically we're talking about a maximum of, of 24,000 people, which is already very reflective of a wider sector of society. The way you engage with those people is very similar to the way you engage with the wider audience of the electorate. And my uh, opinion is that the more we actually engage with people, irrespective of their political belief, the better uh, the, the, the results will be, and the more genuine the party would be able to reflect the difficulties, the, the aspirations, the issues, the problems of real life of every citizen which will eventually then vote and translate because a party basically is a vehicle which then uh, aspires to get into government to be able to do good and improve the quality of life of people. Again, I don't enjoy too much putting people in a pigeonhole, so I wasn't saying that there is labor youth. There are young people. There are young people, and in my mind today, my young people are very versatile, so they might vote Labour today, nationalists at another time, not vote maybe because they are disenchanted. So the key in my mind is engaging. Engaging not with a premise or a prejudice that you have voted already for another party, but engaging, understanding what your aspirations in life are, where you want to get, what you want to achieve, what your difficulties are. I don't think it really makes a difference for an 18-year-old, a 19-year-old, a 16-year-old who also will vote whether he is red or blue when we are talking about affordable housing. I don't think it makes a, dif a difference whether you voted red or blue or your family voted red or blue if we're talking about the environment. Either the environment is an issue or it isn't. Either housing is an issue or it isn't. Either employment is an issue or it isn't. So I think being honest and talking about the subjects, about the sectors, about the policies, about what will change your life is the simplest and most truthful way to engage and then persuade. But at least not preaching from above, but actually going, meeting, uh, having contact with, with, with people and then persuading them. In its current state, what would you consider to be the Nationalist Party's main problems? And should you be re-elected as leader, how do you plan on solving them? I think originally, originally the, the, the main problem was that after 25 years in government, maybe we did not realize that we are in a position. And that we have to stay in a position for a while to 
rejuvenate ourselves, uh, maybe do enough changes to, to uh, actually convince people that what they did not believe in anymore, they will then regain trust in uh, giving us the, the privilege to, to, to govern once again. And this takes time, it doesn't happen overnight. Governments change, parties are in government and in opposition, but we at least have to take the attitude that we are in opposition. I think we are doing that now. But I think we need to change more, present new faces, show that what we had done wrong in the past we acknowledge, remind also about what we had done good and, 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 and properly and correctly and what investments and how the National Party changed the face of Malta, but also that we learn from our mistakes and won't repeat them again. That there are new people who will not take uh, attitudes of old. That our attitude has changed, but not our values. That our aspirations have now taken new directions because the achievements of the past are not enough to inspire anyone who is looking also at the future, but with a sense of humility that needs to define us. Uh, I think. That is a fundamental in the National Party. I, I, I promise to take the National Party back to the people. That's what I will continue striving to do. And if we succeed in doing that, then I think it is then natural that if we take back the party to the people, then the people will understand that it is not our National Party looking at them, but they become part of that National Party because they own it, they, they understand, they are uh, becoming also uh, embracing of the cause, which will be then also of benefit to the country because the purpose of the wind uh, and governing, not only out of authority, but out of embracing the uh, common good, is I think something that people can acknowledge, embrace, and be persuaded to vote for. With regards to the country, what would you consider to be Malta's biggest problems and should the people ever trust you to become Prime Minister, how would you address these problems? I think right now one of the major issues is our reputation, which sadly Labour government has literally destroyed the good work of a number of years where we could present ourselves on the international market given the size of our country, no raw materials. We depend on business investment coming from overseas. If we do not succeed in attracting inward investment, foreign inward investment, it is very difficult to, to, to uh, sustain our economic models. Another issue is that government has strangely chosen, even knowing that the Maltese islands are the most densely populated, to choose an economic model based on increase of population, which is not sustainable. There are environmental considerations, which are paramount. We declared a national uh, environment emergency in November, but since then did little much about it. So taking all these together, I think the priorities are A, planning ahead, not like this government had done, choosing the right economic models, fixing our reputation, and working day and night to be able to do that, something which I think this government will be unable to do, and creating models of development which are sustainable. You you mentioned um, overpopulation. It's an issue which you have spoken a great deal about in terms of its side effects on the economy, on the people. Um, what is your view on the issue? Do you think it's related to illegal migration or an overall mismanagement of legal mig legal immigration? And how would you alter it in terms of changing the econo economic model should the PN be re-elected to government? I, I think it was a decision that government made. From the very start, the government started literally uh, other than legal immigration, actually declaring and saying, and, and publicly so, even on international uh, fora, that he wants to import labor because the model chosen for growth is consumption. So the more people you have, the more they consume. A 
at a point we were at 10,000 people a year being imported to our country. Sadly, most of them on cheap labor. So it's not a question of attracting talent, attracting foreigners to more to invest because we need them. Uh, skill exchange, expertise, which is all good. This, this was different. This was simply uh, a chosen path that if we increase our population from 500 to 600 to 800 to a million, that was the mark actually, then the GDP would grow. I don't subscribe to that at all because I don't measure the success of our country only on GDP, which is the total spent by a country, but on the well-being of every single individual citizen of our country, which doesn't translate automatically in a proportionate ratio because you could have very few earning millions and most earning billions. So it doesn't work in the manner that government was trying to express it. Uh, the solution is also uh, found in economic choices. If we choose economic models which do not depend on that, then you do not advertise those. You do not go on that direction. You choose models which are based on value-added services, models which, like we had in the past, we can keep on growing, gaming, uh, aerospace, shipping, insurance, services industries, artificial intelligence, knowledge-based, where it is not the number of people that come to Malta, which count, but the value that we can create, which can then also be exported. It's a choice. We want to do it. And I think it's more beneficial for the uh, circumstances and realities of an island, a tiny island state in the Mediterranean in the middle of a European reality. In, in 2020, what, what does it mean to be a nationalist? What makes one a nationalist? And what do you think the nationalist party should stand for? It is not only one thing, but values which are not only stated, but uh, which you subscribe to. Life. number of issues that have cropped up and I have, I have always been consistent as has my party uh, that the value of life is not negotiable an intrinsic value social justice that you do not create models of well-being which benefit only a few but you need to have a social justice which is uh, in Maltese not allowing anyone to fall behind in society, not based on a system of handouts, but on a system of creating opportunity, creating structures which push people to be able to become better in a holistic manner. The value of equality, which is uh, not discriminating between any person, whether it's creed, whether it's gender, whether it's age in a manner which is not only legalistic but also on a, on a humane and human level the value of democracy and freedom of expression which we take for granted today which is under threat because if you know the institutions and render them totally uh, innocuous then the pillars of our democratic structure would have been destroyed so, uh, when we talk about freedom of expression, it doesn't mean that I allow you to speak only if you subscribe to the same uh, philosophy, creed, ideology, politics, but even if you criticize me. So, there are a number of issues which I think define the nationalist party, which has always been consistent education. It's not only building schools, but showing that you really believe in education. You respect both the uh, lecturers, teachers, people who actually want to, to, to dedicate themselves to teaching and also the students giving them all the options possible. The National Party has always put education at the forefront of its uh, politics in our country. Putting these all together, it is, if I had to put everything in a few words, putting the person at the center of politics rather than the state. In, in a small country like Malta, um, nepotism and corruption can be more widespread due to white size as an island. And the phrase Kulhat and Kulhat is quite synonymous with this issue. 
would would you be willing to um, ta tackle these issues head on in a small island like Malta, even if it comes at the expense of losing votes? I think the issue of being a small island is an excuse. Yes, uh, I would have stated. I don't think we have to get or put these excuses uh, that we're small in order to destroy the, the, the concepts of level playing field, fairness, correctness, good governance. No. Corruption is wrong? Absolutely. So there are no excuses. Whether it's people you know or you don't know, whether it's for fear or for favor, it is wrong. We need to fight it because it is illegal and it is immoral. And we can show that we can still grow better, stronger, uh, fairer without corruption. We don't need it. If you are uh, somebody who merits something, you get it. If you are working hard, you get it. If you risk, you may fail, you may not. Government is there to give the direction. Uh, enterprise, free enterprise is there to create wealth. Fairness has to be guaranteed across the board because it is government's job to ensure that. And we do not need corruption. We need hard work. We need belief in ourselves. We need government structures to help us, to invest, to participate. Uh, with initiatives, legislative proposals, and we need to start again believing that the Maltese people in general are not corrupt people. We believe in hard work. Maltese people are hard working people. They work, they save, they invest. They want a simple life. They want to live in a nicer country, a greener country. They love family. It is an important value, which maybe some bigger countries have forgotten, and we need to build on that. And I'm pretty convinced that by not allowing ourselves to, to fall into the consumeristic models and patterns of money only, we can do it. A more delicate issue which has been building up over time is that of abortion in terms of the pro-choice versus pro-life framing which this issue gets where do you stand on it i think i have been very clear and consistent and constant on this uh, i would not contemplate uh, even for a minute that we consider killing to be an option when we talk about rights we are talking about rights and obligations when we are talking about choices we are talking about something that affects uh, that person who can choose to terminate somebody else's life. And what is the age until you can do that? What is the difference between the unborn child, a person, and the 90-year-old citizen? What? It is life. When you ask me about our values, life. It is a value which is an absolute value which for me is uh, sacred and, and there's no, no negotiation on that so when I hear people arguing about choices in order for me to be able to value the choice of the unborn child let him speak and then we will see whether he chooses to be killed so I'm very clear on the are there any cases or instances where you would consider an abortion uh, permissible in terms of it taking place? Rape instead the like the mother's life we can danger. We can uh, try to stretch our imagination to think of a uh, hundred different cases to be able to start slowly, slowly uh, creating loopholes, creating doubt, creating what if situations that would be the beginning of then a whole line of others which would uh, temper with a value life is a value so if you want to tell me that there are considerations to be made or discussions to be made i would say yes let's discuss how to help people to do the right choices let us help those who decide to have even an unwanted pregnancy going through. 
and then the state has to ensure that that person and, and the child then have a decent healthy life we need to also not treat people who do a wrong choice or maybe a choice for a wrong reason not to be treated as a criminal but to be helped even in so far as mental issues are concerned because humanity dictates that do you think that abortion is more related to a, a woman's reproductive rights and health care or more connected to the ethical and moral value which life should be given? Very simple. I think abortion is killing. So it's not related to anything. It's killing. The unborn child is human. It's killing. So anyone enjoys academic discussion, he enjoys it. But abortion is killing. And in my mind, there is no instance where killing should be permitted. Should Big Brother it be the Nationalist Party or Labour Party in government? Should there ever be a referendum on abortion and the, um, hypothetically the majority of the Maltese population votes in favour of having it introduced? Would you respect that decision? I don't think that there should be a referendum. I don't think that a society like ours, which prides itself of being kind, humane, based on family values and uh, Christian principles, should contemplate or vote whether we should kill or not. Lately, there has been quite the discussion about the free press, the media, the party media, propaganda, and so on and so forth. Should you become Prime Minister, how do you plan on extending and protecting the rights of journalists in light of the recent decisions taken by the Broadcasting Authority and the government, so, such as cancelling Shara Bank, um, centering the questions of journalists during COVID-19 press conferences? How would you plan on safeguarding the free press and the media in Malta? I am... I am very adamant that freedom of expression should be protected in a manner which which really renders our country uh, a democracy and uh, decisions being taken by government are not uh, coming to me as a surprise because Robert Abella had actually stated that he was unhappy with how the public broadcasting was not uh, actually favoring the Labour Party which is sad in my mind we need to understand that it is a public service and not a government television station or a party station. We have already proposed uh, constitutional changes which ensure that the public broadcasting authority uh, should not be uh, having a majority where government decides. So that is protecting with the constitution and the setting that at the Cleveland there is uh, certainly a guarantee for free speech and non-discrimination at that level. And it's not only for journalists, it's for every single citizen. Journalists certainly, but for every single citizen. Today with social media, everybody is, is uh, able to communicate with the masses. So we need to ascertain that in our country, free speech is enjoyed by one and all within the parameters of law because rights have to be then always measured with rights and privacies of others, so within the parameters of the law, but certainly not by having government with a lunga manus and, and the strength to, 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 to change, to choose, to manipulate, to dictate what we hear or what we don't, what is on our public, public, not government, television, and then it is the people who decide whom to hear, what to hear, but at least also guarantee that we are not flooded, and, and we speak very little about this, with fake news, because that is another consideration. Today there's so many uh, data out there flooding uh, everyone, and literally every minute on your hands, that we need to start understanding how to learn what is true and what is not. I'm, I'm not talking only about what I'm talking about anywhere in the world, really. So that is something else. Why not teach our students, for example, how to interpret? what's on the media, how, how, how to realize and be able to know what's, what's, what's fake and what's not. So 
there's a lot to do there and I think government has very little interest to do it because he prefers to have uh, his, his, his strong hand dictating and manipulating what people actually think. Uh, first of all, how do you plan on attracting the more liberal-oriented uh, PN supporters, if you were to be elected, of course? I made a little bit of a mention before that, that I uh, do not really enjoy pigeonholing people and, and, and you know, labelling people. So, so when we say liberal, I would rather be discussing different uh, subject items, item per item. Uh, so, in today's world, what, what, what would we deem to be liberal? I think that there is uh, a beauty in our party that we are not uh, homogeneous in the sense that just one train of thought, but we can embrace a myriad, a rainbow of, of ideas where we come together, we discuss. There are issues that uh, we agree upon, others that we don't. But I see very little uh, where there is no uh, ability to engage. Uh, maybe in the past there was. In the last three years, for example, while it's, I've been here, um, I barely recall one instance where uh, there were issues where we did not have consensus across the board. We need to engage more, we need to discuss more, but I am hardly anticipating any particular issues which, which I can see as being liberal that we, 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 we cannot discuss or engage with, but I'd rather be more specific in order to get into the, the depth. In an election that is uh, basically happening to replace your leadership after you lost a number of confidence votes, what sense does it make for you to contest once again? Does this not contradict what you demanded of Joseph Muscat in late 2019? Uh, no, I, I don't recall uh, asking for Joseph Muscat uh, how, how, how to uh, basically act in so far as his internal elections are concerned was very vociferous in my criticism of Joseph Muscat in so far as corruption issues were concerned. The elections of, of confidence that you uh, refer to in our statute are not those related to the leadership. So when I am actually contesting this election, I am doing so with full adherence to our statute and because I respect it. And because I respect the members who elected me, our statute says that it is the members who elect a party leader. It doesn't even provide that anyone else can remove him. It simply provides that the term is still uh, the election, the general election, and then after the general election, uh, the party leader will, 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 will uh, move out, uh, particularly when we have situations of elections not being um, won by the National Party. So, uh, unless we have a different statute, which we don't, we do not have a system where, if there is a vote at parliamentary level, that changes the leader of the party, because that would go against our statute. So I am defending the democratic right. I was not even obliged to go for this election, because there is nothing in our statute whereby I could have been removed. I chose myself in order to strengthen the party, irrespective of whether they choose me again as leader, to ask our councillors, because it's the only way we could have done it, to then go to the Tesserati so that they are given again themselves, not someone else, the right to be able to vote. If we depart from that, we are abusing our statute, ignoring it, and removing a democratic choice from our people. So if we gave 15,000 people the right to choose their leader, I see it as a complete uh, the economy that 15, 20, 80, 100 people can change that decision. And our statute actually does not provide for that. Uh, it would have been like you are suggesting if after the election of the Tesserati, I in some weird, bizarre manner persist in, in uh, not respecting that decision. I think it's the other way around. I think we have a situation where there were a few in the National Party who did not respect the decision of the Tesserati, which was having their leader till term. On Rosen Brass, you mentioned that action will be taken against some of the so-called uh, liberal MPs, uh, obviously if you were elected. 
Are there any actions about from, apart from removing them from the shadow cabinet that you plan on taking against them? For example, um, removing their right to contest on the PN ticket? I did not specifically say that I'm taking action against and it doesn't make sense when we're, we're not in a disciplinary camp here. What I said is, uh, if there are some which do not want, because they do not have trust, because they have decided otherwise, to work together with the leader, you cannot uh, get them to do that, so you need to move on without them. So it's not a question of disciplinary action. It's not, it's, uh, that's not the case. We need to have a party which is strong, we need to have a parliamentary group which is strong, we need to have structures which work, we need to work towards a general election. Anyone who wants to move forward in that direction is welcome. If there are some, a few, who persist in not wanting to do so with me as leader, they have to make way for others. Otherwise they would be incompatible with the position that they are occupying. What is your opinion on the Green New Deal concept, which was explained by the EU Commission President von der Leyen? And do you think that Malta should take a similarly revolutionary attitude towards it? I can't be certain about the dates, but I think I actually uh, had anticipated that because I am very passionate about the environment. My children are very passionate about the environment. Actually, it's the only thing they uh, are interested in. Anything else I say, they're not really bothered about it. Uh, and one of them actually really gets angry if I don't, every time I don't mention the environment. And I think she's right. We have a global emergency. Unless we understand that, and simply because we are not put into the oven, not understand that our planet is overheating, is madness. Sadly, uh, society today, humans today, would, would panic if somebody gets a bed, suffers a bed. But our whole planet is suffering these bends. Would we not all panic if right now uh, one person, one animal, one, one creature uh, is a light on fire? Who would all panic? I had given the example of the Greta Thunberg example of press the, the panic button. Our planet is burning. And unless we stop it, that overheating will create a cataclysmic effect of events one after the other. When we have kids and they are sick, we, we, we test them with a thermometer to see the temperature. And if it exceeds a certain degree, we give them some medicine. If it exceeds more, we give them more cure, if it becomes really high, the mercury going up, then it's, it's, it's an emergency. The temperature of our climate is hitting the top uh, bars there. So we need to act and we need to act now. I've spoken about the zero carbon uh, island that I would like to see. We need to take decisions, we need to teach the choices that we make every single day drinking out of a glass uh, container, drinking out of a plastic uh, bottle which you throw away. The way we live our lives day to day can have massive effects. And Malta being in this particular region is one of the region which is reacting worstly after uh, Antarctica to climate change. We need to act, we need to act now. How would you go about combating the ever-growing rent prices and the cheap labour wages, which are currently plaguing a lot of families in Malta? Certainly by not continuing on the economic model chosen by government to import around 10,000 foreigners every year. That will lessen the pressure on the demand supply chain. Secondly, by committing to actually guaranteeing Sa'af uh, for us Kolkhat every multi-citizen deserves, has a right to at least have a decent abode. We can't have 1,400 and upwards of Maltese and Gossetan citizens who every day hope that they would be called up because they're fighting to have
have a house, to have a home, to have an apartment, to have a room, even. It's, it's very sad about a society which had been boasting surplus after surplus and then have even at least one family which is homeless. So we need to look at the way our economic model works, lessen the burden on the demand uh, supply chain, create structures which can work in so far as social housing are concerned, enable people to earn a decent wage to be able to afford. So when we are looking at the stock that we have which is available and understanding how we are going to grow forward in the ratio of population to those who are employed or otherwise and this will increase now with the unemployment increasing from around 3,400 some six months back now nearly reaching 12,000 this will become worse government has not committed to this and we need to do so we need to provide social housing we need to understand that the wages have to be commensurate to the prices which are uh, currently on the market, lessen the burden, and ensure that everybody, at least, if not owning a property, has enough to be able to rent one. What approach would you take to the subject of reform within the construction industry? First of all, we need to understand that looking only at one side of the coin will leave us exactly where we are. We have been for years now looking at construction and environment as being opposing ends and, and being at loggerheads with each other. We need to start thinking about sustainable development. What does sustainable development it, It's not a, a sort of coined phrase that we, we use lightly. First, how many uh, citizens, inhabitants do we have right now? What's our population? Looking forward, how long will it take to grow to a certain extent? Planning ahead. How many hospitals do we need? How many schools? Transportation system, roads, mass transportation systems. Does the government talk about these things? Do we plan them? Do we look 30 years ahead? So then we work towards that. As soon as we do that, we then can make the choices to ascertain that areas of Malta are protected, that there are no-go zones, that there are green spaces which have to be literally uh, become an intricate part of our fabric of development. Getting planners involved in the solution, not only politicians, planners. Uh, we have had planning authority for years being simply a permitting authority and not a planning authority. We have had lobbies which juggle from one end and others from the other. But we have not seen for decades a planning structure for years, a master plan for our island. 500,000 500, citizens today, 600, 700, 800,000 tomorrow. What are the requirements of housing, of care, of education, of transport, of infrastructure? And deleting out a plan with people who are experts in the field and not only politicians juggling at both ends of the rope to ensure that the sustainable development that we need, because you cannot ignore that there are needs of development, are done in an appropriate manner according to a pre-agreed plan, which ideally is intrinsically moving towards a zero carbon island. What is your view on constitutional reform and do you think that there are any changes that are necessary to go on in the future? Not all of you have participated very intrinsically in the constitutional debate which have led to constitutional reforms that I am very proud to have formed part of Firstly, uh, having a president which is a president for Malta, of the Maltese and Gossetans alike. So the two-thirds needed in Parliament to choose the president rather than government himself being to choose that by himself. Uh, the Chief Justice, that, again, we have reached agreement and they've had constitutional changes who needs to be chosen in the same method. The reviews on the Commission of Police, choice and dismissal, the reviews on the Attorney General, which has that took a lot of work, pressure and determination from the opposition, resigned now, but the splitting of the office of the Attorney General to have advice of the government and Attorney General, and therefore the manner then on how he is chosen and removed, but also then uh, the choices on how the judiciary 
are, are selected and others which still need to uh, be done. We mentioned before one of the media in particular and maybe some others that looking forward we need to ascertain in, in, in a few words that the citizen does not remain tiny in the face of a giant government. So the uh, whole scope of constitutional change is what? To have this document, this shield protecting you as a citizen from a big, powerful state. The more rights you have, the more protection you have, the bigger you grow, and the more comfort and assertion you have that no abuse by government or its agents can be actually perpetrated. Now, what is your view on the legalization of recreational cannabis? I don't think that I actually agree with the word recreational because usually we use it legally to differentiate between medical and recreational. So that is this one thing and legislation has already passed in so far as medical cannabis is concerned. But as soon as we say recreational, it becomes as if it's a choice which does not lead to any consequences. I've uh, met a lot of people who has passed uh, through, through use, which then leads to abuse, of soft drugs, which lead to harder drugs, and leads to then drugs which basically take over your life. It is not recreation. It is a dependency which is sought because there is maybe perceived non uh, adequacy to how to, 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 to be able to enjoy life and um, uh, explore your possibilities in society as an individual with others and the damage that I've seen and spoke with experts and users and uh, families that have been devastated by uh, the abuse of drugs gives me a conviction that it is not wise to go down that route at all. And finally, what is your message to the voters and the public in general? I think it's very similar to the voters and to the public actually because I pledged three years ago to come into the National Party to take it back to the people. And that's what I'm doing. And that's what everyone knows I did. And I was given a mandate of four and a half years. And I wish to be able to look in the face of every single voter that had chosen three years back and say that I will continue that mandate. I need your vote again this time because I still believe in you to give me the possibility of terminating and therefore respecting your own decision because we're going to allow our party to be taken back to a pre-23 nationalist party which was very evidently not in tune with the public and therefore suffered one electoral defeat after another, badly. And we cannot go back to there. We need to ensure that we have new people, new faces, but an attitude which has changed, which reflects that we are in politics to help, to serve, to ensure that we can guarantee better lives for every citizen in more than Gozo and do it in a manner which respects democracy without having corruption seep throughout our institutions and ascertaining the full development of our youth, of our workers, professionals, decent life for our elderly who can still participate in society and for anyone who simply wants to live in a normal country and, and ensure that the country not only governed better, but becomes a country where we are once again all proud to be called what is. Thank you very much for being with us today, Mr. Uh, Dr. Dalia, and thank you for answering our questions, uh, which were given to us by the public. And finally, may the best candidate win. Thank you very much.